Welcome World War 1 Geeks! In the last episode we finished the Newport 17 by Copper State models. And today we will create a nice scenic base and a pilot in what will be the last video of the series. So World War 1 airfields were not necessarily overboarding with visual interest. More or less by definition they had to be flat, short meadows. So we are a bit limited in this regard, but we'll make it work. I really like those vintage wood bases since they somehow go well with the World War 1 look, so this is what we will take as our fundament. You can get them off Amazon for a few bucks and they have a good size for 132 scale aircrafts. First the preparations. I'm masking off everything that I want to keep clean. I also masked the borders of the top surface because I prefer the vignette not to cover the entire area of the base but to leave a bit of a margin to frame the shot. The surface of the base receives some sandpaper peeling in order to provide some grip for the glue. Now there are about 1 million different techniques for how to go on from here but here's how I do it. We need some coarse sand dried up dirt, white glue and any cheap modeling clay. Now let's get dirty. I roll out the clay to shape. I borrowed this handle of my girlfriend's spice mortar which is perfect for the task and easy to clean so I won't have to answer to any questions once she sees this video. As soon as the clay is spread out, I carefully take it off the surface and fix it with white glue. Then I trim the borders with a straight edge. Once we got our shape, I'm covering the clay with a mix of diluted white glue and then sprinkle sand and dirt on it. If you're following this process, just press the dirt in the clay without adding the diluted glue as I do here. Adding more moisture to the clay while it's soft will result in crackling as we will see in a bit. Another tip, if you're taking earth directly from your garden, make sure to try it in the oven for about 30 minutes. That way it's easier to work with and overall more controllable. Once finished, I leave this artwork to dry for roughly 24 hours. In this shot it becomes pretty obvious why adding the diluted white glue to the soft clay wasn't exactly big brain time. Pretty massive cracks, hmm? If you're doing something like a North Africa diorama, you could make use of this cracking property, but for Eastern France it's of course a bit overdramatic. Now it's relatively easy to fix this. Just take some clay and fill up the cracks. Then cover all your traces with the sand-dirt mixture. The annoying part is of course that you will have to wait for it to dry again. So another day later we are finally good. I'm glazing the whole base with diluted white glue again so that all the stones won't go anywhere anymore. Now nothing's better than starting paintwork on a fresh canvas. So I'm priming the base with black mist the surfacer. By the way. As it turns out, the clay needed even more than 24 hours to dry thoroughly, because after the glue has set, we end up with some cracks again. But this time they're small enough to be integrated in the scene, or better, under the scene, as they will be covered. Unfortunately, I couldn't find my 0.4mm airbrush needle, so I had to spray it with the 0.50mm that was already in the gun. Spraying the whole surface with such a tiny caliber is as much fun as it sounds. Not only did it take me 20 minutes to cover the damn thing, but the coat wasn't even super even. However, it's more than good enough for our purpose. On the good side, those painful 20 minutes gave me the motivation boost to look again for my 0.4mm needle and I actually found it. And that's right in time, because we are now about to layer up our earthen base coats. I start with a layer of red brown. And boy, it's so much more pleasant with that bigger needle. 
following this first layer, I'm misting over increasingly brighter and thinner layers using flat earth and buff. At the end, we are left with a nicely shaded base coat that will provide a great base for further dusting and for the static grass that we will apply next. If you're doing a lot of bases or dioramas, static grass applicators are a great tool to have since they are rather cheap and easy to use. The secret behind a convincing result is to layer different tones and length of grass, just like we did when we painted the earth base. I'm preparing the underground with yet another layer of white glue and spread it thinly and evenly on the surface that I want my grass to grow on. I'm starting off with a short 4mm cut that has a bright green color representing the young leaves. Unfortunately, I zoned out and forgot to press the record button during that first pass, so I can only present you its initial result. Luckily, we still have a few more layers for demonstration purpose. Next on the list is another 4mm mix called Patchy, which contains a lot of brown and olive tones. This one adds a lot of tonal variety and helps us to imitate the undercoat of the meadow. Lastly, we finalize our garden work with the 6mm Wild Meadow mix. It again adds a lot of color including yellow, green and even some purplish tones. The layering is really key even if you decide to paint the grass later on as it allows you to achieve a wild, irregular surface due to the different length. Personally, I don't see the need to paint the grass here since the result, at least in terms of color, is pretty realistic. Where it lacks though is in terms of vegetation. Now, if my own garden told me one thing, then it's that you usually have tons of herbs, weeds and wildflowers between the grass. To cover for that, I got myself the set of laser cut plants by Ammo, but I was left a bit disappointed since I found most of the plants to be off scale. I mean, come on, in which European vegetation do you find flowers the size of a pilot's head? So I decided to only use the smaller flowers, which I painted white since the original colors were a bit too saturated for my taste. It also turns out that RLM4 is not only great for Luftwaffe fighters, but does also a decent job when painting daisies. Now let's have a look at the earth section of the base, shall we? A good way to add some variation to earth grounds and some sand to your mind is by picking out single stones. I prepare a range of different colors including grays, deck tan, dark yellow and our beloved horizon blue. Tamiya paints are usually not the best for brush application, but I'm out of the corresponding Vallejo colors, so yeah, that's that. It's a fun little task that seems tedious in the beginning, but is actually quite soothing. Just turn on your favorite podcast and let it flow. By the way, if you have any great podcast recommendations, feel free to share them with me in the comments. Now back to the stones. Don't worry if you find them too dominant after painting. We will tone them down with dust effects in the next steps. Therefore, I prepared the surface with white spirit in which I then plant enamel dust mix by Ammo.
This will help to achieve the dried out summer look I was thinking of when I weathered the plane. Speaking of which, for the last step, I'm taking the same pigment mix I used on the plane and carefully dust it over the surface. So what's left to do you might ask? Well not too much. In one of my reference photos you see a bunch of new ports that are lined up along a white chalk line and I thought this would be a nice detail to reproduce. No big surprises here. I'm simply brushing the thing down with my airbrush and without any guidance line since the original was everything but perfectly straight. And with that, we're coming to the part of the video that caused me the most headache. The pilot. See, I'm a mediocre figure painter at best and I'm definitely nowhere in a position of doing a tutorial on figure painting. As a matter of fact, I'm mostly following tutorials myself while painting them. However, I still wanted to include the painting in the video as it's such a central element to the whole thing. So, off to the star of the show. Our pilot, Monsieur André Erbelin. Well, technically, it's just a random pilot figure, but it's our model, so we get to decide. Like the kit, the figure is from Copper State model and it's a really fine resin cast with superb details such as these fur applications on the flight suit or those ornaments on the hat. As said, the quality is close to perfect and there are no cosmetic works needed except for cleaning some injection marks and gluing the parts together. Pre-shading the figure is always a good idea because it kind of provides you with a map for shadows and highlights. I start out with a coat of good old Mr. Surfacer Black. Next, I spray flat white, more or less perpendicular from the top onto the figure. That way, the white color will lay down gradually on the most exposed areas such as the shoulders and all the folds and details of the figure really start to pop. The base coat is applied with two to three layers of very diluted paint to preserve the shading. Then I am refining the work with shadows and highlights, of which I usually do between one or two different grades, depending on the base color and the level of contrast I am aiming for. For the flight suit, I am using flat earth that I darken with black and brighten with Japanese uniform. Once I got everything as I wanted, I am applying a thick wash of shadow brown. This wash has several functions. It blends the different layers, it adds some grime, and it simply makes the whole thing look more leathery. The navy blue for the uniform jacket is a mix of Prussian blue, black, and surprise surprise, horizon blue, because we use it for virtually everything in this project. Shadows and highlight are done by adding black and horizon blue respectively, while the golden applications are painted in, well, gold. So, like most wannabe figure painter, I'm especially struggling with faces and skin tones. My favorite tutorial is from a Portuguese user on Planet Figure that you might also know from Night Shift. I leave a link to it in the description. The basic idea is to lay down a base coat of brown sand, then apply a glaze of cavalry brown. Before you start highlighting by adding more and more flat flesh to your brown sand base coat. In between, I am painting the white of the eyes with an off-white mix from white and of course horizon blue. I will paint the pupils with oil paint later, 
Not because it looks better, but because I usually need more than one try to get it right and oils are more convenient to cover your traces. Once you're happy with the face, you can add a very light glaze of red to the cheeks to make the face look more lively. Even though lively is a big word when it's staring at you with blank zombie eyes. This is followed up by another light glaze, this time with brush and blue, to imitate unshaved skin. And that's it! After 4 months we can finally take this project from our list. I am really happy with how the plane itself turned out. The base and the figures are okay. Now that I see them completed, I would have some ideas how to improve the base with some more scenery, but at this point I would really like to leave this project behind and start with something new. This new project will start in the next video, so make sure to subscribe to the channel to not miss out on it. Small hint, it won't contain any Horizon Blue. In the meantime, thank you for following me on this journey and I hope to see you all in the next video. See you guys!